My name is David Nutt. I'm a psychiatrist, psychopharmacologist, and uh, now I'm chair of drug science. Psychopharmacology is the study of how drugs affect the brain. And uh, over the last 40 years, I have probably given more different kinds of drugs to human beings than anyone else alive, maybe ever. In fact, I don't think there's a class of drug that I haven't actually tested out on humans to explore what goes on in the brain when you take drugs. And it was that vast experience I had of, of the effects of different drugs, which got me appointed to the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs back in about 2000, when I chaired their scientific committee, the technical committee. I did that for nine years and did a lot of analysis of uh, drug harms, thinking about different ways in which we can assess the harms of drugs. And it was a very successful period. Um, uh, so successful that uh, in 2008, they promoted me competitively after competitive tender to the chair of the ACMD. I succeeded that uh, Sir Michael Rawlings in that chair. But quite soon after, things started to go uh, a little bit awry. And that was because I published a paper that tried to make sense of the real harms of ecstasy. And I compared uh, the harms of ecstasy with those of horse riding. And to my surprise, and to everyone uh, else's surprise, I suspect, it turns out that horse riding is more harmful than ecstasy. And that didn't go down very well with the Home Secretary at the time. That was a, a certain Jackie Smith who, who complained I was being very hard on horse riders and confusing people by comparing an, an illegal activity, taking MDMA with a legal activity, horse riding, uh, to which I replied, well, you can't make things illegal unless you've got some idea of how harmful they are in, in comparison with other activities, particularly legal ones. But that, that didn't resonate, that argument didn't resonate. Uh, and I was put on notice. And then uh, a few months later, I was uh, under a new Home Secretary, um, Alan Johnson, and I was talking about our recent research on comparative harms. We'd published a paper, which uh, was a very seminal paper, looking at the relative harms of um, about 20 different drugs. And to a lot of people's surprise, alcohol came out surprisingly high in that. And I was asked about what that meant. And I said, well, it means that alcohol is more harmful than drugs like LSD, for instance. Uh, at that point, the world went mad. And uh, I was sacked for confusing the public and for campaigning to make psychedelics legal, which I wasn't. Uh, but it really highlighted the fact that the rational discourse on psychedelics was impossible in uh, that, that, that climate, which was actually a Labour government. And it's got somewhat worse since, because uh, certainly uh, the previous Prime Minister, Theresa May, has had a, a peculiar antipathy to psychedelics, uh, even if they can be used therapeutically to, uh, to develop innovative treatments for disorders like depression and addiction. Uh, well, being sacked in some ways was quite beneficial to me because it meant I was free from the shackles of trying to serve two masters. Uh, I went back to the research. I started studying psychedelics, uh, discovered the enormous burden that the regulations, uh, that, uh, them being in Schedule 1, uh, impose on researchers. But we fought through them. Um, I was determined that uh, we should at least know what psychedelics do when they're given to people. And we did the first brain imaging studies of psychedelics, and they were truly groundbreaking. Because up to that point, everyone had assumed that Timothy Leary, who was the great uh, protagonist of psychedelics in the 1960s, was right. He, be we, he believed, we all believed that psychedelics turned on the brain. But it turns out they don't. When you do brain imaging studies of psychedelics, you see that they rather selectively turn off parts of the brain. And those parts of the brain they turn off happen to be the parts of the brain which drive depression. And based on that insight, we uh, achieved funding, the only funding we'd ever achieved from the government, from the Medical Research Council, to do a study of psilocybin in people with resistant depression. Depression is the largest burden of disability in any illness in the Western world, including Britain. And uh, it's a very difficult disorder to treat. It strikes in young people and often destroys the rest of their lives. And we showed that a single trip from psilocybin could produce enduring benefits for weeks or months in the majority of people who had failed on other interventions such as antidepressant drugs and cognitive behavior therapy. And that opened up uh, a whole new area of research companies have set up to work on psychedelics and drug science itself has set up a, a working group, a psychedelic working group to try to 
facilitate research in this area, which is still severely hampered by the fact that psilocybin and other psychedelics are still Schedule One drugs. They're Class A drugs. So working with them is really, really complex, difficult, and expensive. And the deterrence to many researchers is such that very few people are prepared to work in that field. One of the remarkable discoveries we made with our uh, brain imaging of psychedelics was that lots of other people were interested. And we had a whole series of biomathematicians coming to us saying, can we look at this data set? Can we make sense of it? And it's been explored more than any other data set I've ever collected, perhaps more than any other imaging data set in the world. And people have approached it in very different ways. But a consensus has emerged. And, and the first is that the effect of psychedelics is to disrupt ongoing brain activity, to produce what's called increased entropy. The brain becomes much more disorganized. Uh, now, people might say, well, that's not going to be useful for a treatment. But in fact, we currently believe, and based on these mathematical insights, that in di disorders like depression, the brain is over-constrained. And you think about it, depressed people get locked into modes of thinking, which they don't want to be locked into. They just can't escape from the negative thoughts. So by disorganizing brain function, you actually allow them for the first time, maybe in months or even years, to see a different way of thinking about themselves in the world. So that fragmentation of brain activity called entropy, increased entropy, is a major insight. And it's opened up a whole new area of, of neuroscience, because up to that point, no one had actually seen a brain looking like that except possibly when you were asleep and dreaming. So now we're talking also to consciousness researchers because they, they, they see that this kind of um, increased connectivity that we see with the disorganized brain actually may be important in explaining why people can see things differently. I mean, one analogy we've developed is the analogy between the psychedelic brain and the baby's brain. Under a psychedelic, parts of the brain which have not been allowed to talk to each other since you were a baby are liberated and they can you can see much more crosstalk in the brain and that crosstalk may be the reason why people find new solutions to the problems that cause their depression well as a result of uh, the perseverance of my team that uh, we can easily say confidently say that uk leads the world in terms of the brain imaging of a psychedelic state we have done more studies with more drugs than any other country in the world. Uh, so we're at the forefront, despite the fact we still have some of the most restrictive um, regulations. But those regulations actually are limiting our research now, and they're also uh, limiting the rollout of this research into clinical practice. And they're utterly unnecessary. It, it is almost inconceivable that any scientist would misuse these drugs because their careers would end, and also their research would end. And we're in the, we're in the business of studying these drugs, not using these drugs. If Britain wants to stay at the cutting edge, we have to do something sensible. We have to make it easier for researchers to, to get hold of them and to be allowed to have them and allowed to research them. And I would strongly recommend some revision of the Misuse of Drugs Act to liberate scientists, academics, from the constraints which are very, very disabling. But it also makes me rather sad to think that it's, uh, it's taken 40 years before someone has been able to do this research. The Misuse of Drugs Act made psychedelics illegal in 1971. And the fact that it was over 40 years before anyone was able to work with them is extremely disabling. And, and so we have made major progress. We have done things that no one else has been able to do, but it's been at a huge cost and it's taken much longer than it should have done. And when you reflect on how much science could have been done in the last 50 years with psychedelics, the number of neuroscientists that could have worked with them since 1971. There's hundreds of thousands of scientists, I'm sure would have been fascinated to work with these compounds, but they've not been allowed to. So I think this is the worst censorship of research in the history of science, because the opportunities that have been lost have been immense. And we need, really do need to reflect on that and just try to accelerate what is currently an, a very exciting, promising new area of science. We've got to turn it into a, a mainstream of science and also hopefully a mainstream of therapy. When I've worked in the field of drug harms all my life, I've worked in the field of drug policies. Really since the late 1990s, I was brought in by the government to advise on how we might reduce deaths from ecstasy. I was part of that working group, and that working group actually produced some of the most sensible, profound, and impactful uh, 
changes to policy that there have been, and they were extraordinarily simple. We said two things. We said that all venues that in which people use MDMA should provide free water so that people don't dehydrate. And we also recommended, uh, and most of them took it up, that they should also provide a chill-out room. And those two simple messages effectively eliminated deaths from dehydration and MDMA. It was a major gain in terms of public health. Since then, the message has been much more towards, let's try to stop people using drugs by scaring them off and by testing them and, uh, and by trying to limit access than what I think we should be doing, which is harm reduction. That policy has failed. This country now has more deaths of people using opiates each year than it's ever had in its history. We also have more deaths from MDMA than we had before because our policies have actually driven the production of a stronger, cheaper version of MDMA. And we've now got this terrible burden of spice because we have in our absurdity tried to test people for cannabis keep them in prison longer because they tested positive for cannabis and they have switched to spice. Last year, we had 70 deaths in prison from spice. We've never had a death in prison from cannabis. So there's a general rule. The prohibition and punishment of drug users tends to lead to people using stronger, more dangerous drugs. It leads to more deaths. And it's really time now that we looked at the whole issue of drug policy as a public health issue, try to reduce the harms, try to give people access to to safer ways of using drugs, safer places to use drugs. And on top of that, revise the drug laws so that we can study these drugs. One of the real anomalies, we've got a, a rising death toll from fentanyls. Many of those fentanyls are not medicines. In fact, almost none of them are medicines, which means they're all controlled under the Psychiatric Substances Act, which means that people can't access them even to find out what they do, what, they, what, their, what their pharmacology is, or even how to find antidotes. So the, the drug laws really impede research at many levels, not just in, in terms of psychedelic research. So let's have a very, let's have a shake up. Let's, let's put some logic to play. Let's facilitate science and let's also reduce the harms to people who use drugs.